Hello, my name is Makassi, and this is the review of the Visbum Bandana Liner Coat. Please watch my previous video with regard to the material to the battle of greasy grass. It will make you appreciate this beautiful garment so much more. And I know most of you didn't, so you know, what? I'm just gonna include it right now. This product utilizes rayon fabric. Please be aware of the following point below and exercise a degree of caution when using this product. The colors of the garment may bleed onto other garment when wet or excessively rubbing occurs. This product utilizes a very delicate fabric. It is not intended for strenuous physical activity as it may damage the fabric and stitching. Rubbing and friction may cause peeling on the surface of the fabric. Rayon may be easily torn when wet. It is not intended for strenuous physical activity as it may damage the fabric. This product has been processed using a natural dye. Thus, each piece will have a unique color, texture, and an appearance where no one product is alike. A characteristic of using natural dye is that the dye may accumulate around the seams and pockets area causing each piece to become unique. Due to the use of natural dye, with repeated wears, it is characteristic for the color to fade from the garment and develop a unique appearance. Please be aware that the garment may bleed onto other garment when wet or excessive rubbing occurs. This product utilizes 100% natural down filling. As such, feathers may come out through seams. Please carefully remove loose feathers. If garments become wet or moist from usage, please dry thoroughly before storing. Avoid folding jacket tightly when in storage to preserve the natural lightness of the down filling. If the outer membranes ripped or become torn, seal with many tapes to prevent loss of down filling. The metal component used in this product can be discolored or even rusted due to its characteristics. This product has hand stitched detailing, giving each product a unique appearance. Be careful not to snag the thread during wear. This product is not intended for strenuous physical activity as it may damage the hand stitch areas. Because of this, we will not repair this product. Parts of the garment utilize a vintage fabric, thus the appearance pattern, textures, and color is unique to each where no one piece is alike. Possible fraying, scratches, holes, and blemishes are characteristic of vintage fabric. Please be aware that this garment is not defective as the use of vintage fabric is intentional. Today's manufacturing process has plateaued in a way. Mass production is the norm, with products moving from one end of the manufacturing line to another, and manufacturing processes involving human beings are limited, resulting in the absence of individual skill and personal character in finished products. People simply make uniform, predictable products. I suppose one could say that this is something many of us were once striving to achieve. I feel that the combination of natural dyes and modern manufacturing techniques create the potential for future goods that possess both individual character and a personal touch. This is because natural dyeing cannot be controlled perfectly. Factors that cannot be controlled by humans result in product individuality and depth. And by adding this dyeing process to modern manufacturing approaches, it is easy to inject a bit of unique unique character into even mass-produced products. This is something that I started thinking about several years ago when I was making indigo dye products. Since then, I have enjoyed creating items for each successive collective collection while striving to utilize the fusion of natural dyes and modern manufacturing with the goal of making interesting products. Natural indigo dye. The concept of using the blue pigment found in certain plants to dye fabric came to Japan from China during the 3rd, 4th centuries and became widely used after the industrialization of cotton production during the Edo period. Known for increasing the strength of cotton and acting as a deterrent to insect, indigo dyes was often used in traditional Japanese utilitarian garments like the noragi and yakata. It is resistant to metals, acids, and alkali and holds its color relatively well. Pale shades have low resistance to infrared light from the sun and indoor light and will, and will exhibit unique fading over time. Mud dye, a type of vegetable dyeing technique originated from Amami, Oshima, and Okinawa. The bark of the Japanese hawthorn is boiled and the resulting liquid is used to dye the garment. After the first dye, the garment is immersed in iron-rich mud from local rice paddies which bring about a natural reaction with the iron ions to create a deep brown color. For this technique, a garment must be dyed over 30 times to achieve a light mud color and over 100 times to achieve a dark mud color. Will this color if exposed to fruit acid and will turn a reddish color if exposed to detergents containing alkali. Mud soaking. The garment is soaked and dyed in iron-rich mud from local Amami Oshima rice paddies. Mud soaking results in high resistance to light, 
mud-soaked fabric will turn black upon contact with plant nectar or sap. Vegetable dyed. Dye made from boiling plant or insects and combining the resulting liquid with iron or aluminum to create a color reaction. Unlike synthetic dye, where it is possible to achieve consistent coloring, it is said that vegetable dye never yields the exact same color twice. For darker shades, one must dye the garment many times. This color is when exposed to infrared lights, metal, food acid, and detergent that contain alkalis. Generally, I have this new rule for myself. I don't like to look at other YouTubers for information because I never want their opinion to get in my head. And I also don't want to copy their stuff. What I mean by that is, a year ago, I wrote this amazing, amazing script. And then I made a mistake of clicking on this fashion YouTuber. I won't name his name. But I watched his video and essentially it was the video that I wrote. So I, I had to throw that whole script away. And you know, had I not watched it, I could have had, you know, plausible deniability with Visvum, you know, I, I knew I'm not the most, I don't have the most knowledge on them. So I broke that rule and then I found this channel. They seem to be very knowledgeable. The guys that are on there, they're very knowledgeable. And what I've learned from them is that the lining went through mud dye process and then also indigo and cochineal. The indigo dye was used to dye the army blue. The cochineal dye was used to make the Native American red. And then the mud, it was used to show the pooping that happened when the US Army was hit by arrows by the Native American. Hiroki, he's a man of culture. Okay, let's start with the down. They really emphasize this point, really try to drill it into my head. White Polish goose down. So I looked into it, here's what I found. To classify as a Polish goose down, the eggs of the goose must be purchased from Polish government breeding program called the Polish National Research Institute of Animal Breeding. They started this process of breeding white goose down species called the white Kaluda in 1962. All of the hatcheries in Poland, they must acquire a license from the government to breed these geese. And all of these red tape, they just mean that it's easy to trace in the supply chain because you know, Canada goose, Montclair, they always get this bad rep from animal rights activists about that they're down, they're not sourced ethically. So with this particular jacket, it's so ethical, it's so, the supply chain is so clear, it's so transparent, you need a license from the Polish government. So it just, you cannot get better than that. So what all this red tape means as well is that the price tag, it's gonna be trickled down to the consumer. So that's why the down are so much more expensive. The white Polish goose down, the Kaluda, they're so much more expensive than every other down. And what I what I learned about the Kaluda goose geese is that, so they're raised in free open field. So, you know, they truly can roam, so they're happier. And if you're not a foodie, you know, a cow that can be roaming, a chicken that lived a better life, you know, will have better meat, better skin, better and all that. And they, what, the Polish goose down, they only eat something called the Avena Fatu, which is just a fancy word for common wild oat. And the Polish goose down, they can live in a negative 30 Celsius. And farmer, what I, the research told me is also farmers, they only take the down from the breast and the adamant. So, and they also sort it by hand. So they only choose the largest of downs. And then when it's too small, they don't go in, they don't go into production. So. That's why it takes a long time to gather enough down to make one of these jackets. In my initial impression video, I said it. I said something along the line of, dude, this thing is so lightweight. I am so concerned about this being a nice down jacket for winter, but I was proven so wrong. The ratio is 93 down, 7% leather. A lot of high quality company like Montclair, Canada Goose, Rick Owens, blah, 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 Givenchy, they use the 90 to 10 ratio. And after we've learned about the white Polish goose down, I don't think any of us are complaining about the extra 3%. If anything, we want it to be 95 to 98, you know, it's just, it's great. This down jacket is great. Right now, my warmest jacket is this Canada Goose and it's amazing. When I wear this Canada Goose, I'm sweating when it's 10, 20 degrees out. The bandana, the main reason as to why I got this jacket. So the age of the bandana, the mud dye, it has given the bandana a really nice vintage feel. I read somewhere that the bandana is from the 50 and 60 and to try to confirm that I did extensive Google research, but I couldn't find any actual quote of Hiroki saying it's from those age. So what I did was, if you're looking right now on the jacket, there's some 
words on there and you can see that one of them is wash fast colors all cotton rn14193 the other one is paris accessory bandana all cotton color fast if you do a quick google search on these two brands they were making bandana in the 50 and 60. what i've learned so far is that hiroki he travels a lot so i think hiroki and the team at visman probably source these mainly in person so they can be a bit more thorough with regard to quality control and probably order a few from online supplier that they trust Hiroki is one of those designer that pay a lot of attention to material to the dyeing technique to the construction the pattern making he's he's not too concerned about graphic or logo so he's definitely an asshole to deal with with regard to quality control he looks like a perfectionist to me you know these guys they're very strict when it comes to releasing product with their names or brand there so it's good for us consumer that means he really pay attention to every possible detail. With regard to the look and feel, you can see a bit of pilling on the cotton or the edge of the cotton. There's this dry feel to it when you touch it. The muted red, if you look at a new bandana, it's a bit brighter. This is probably due to the age of the bandana. On top of that, the mud dye process. All of that being said though, you will not be able to tell this bandana from a new bandana when you put it side by side, unless you're Hiroki, unless you're one of the team members from Visbum. I'm gonna say something controversial now and I, I will lay it back, I will justify it the bandana they feel very cheap to the touch it feels like these are just bandana i can go to one of these tourist shops in boston downtown boston and just get for five dollars but then again this is the exact purpose of the original of those bandana that the team at Visum sourced from the special thing about it is the fact that it's from the 50 and 60 and that they were made in america you know which has become a bit more rare you know most symbol 100% 100% cotton product are now based in China, Vietnam, India, Pakistan. You know, mass production is at a new scale now since countries I said it has continued to develop. Couple that with the lack of true workers' right, corrupt government, blah 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 blah. So, you know, it's really not about quality anymore. So we're at an age where it's about how fast is your turnaround from the design to the production. How cheap can you make them? Another thing I've learned is that Japan, Japanese people, they they really, really love American culture. Like most countries around the world, you know, because America outsourced a lot of their culture through films, TV show, colonialism, you know, just the basics. So a lot of people outside America become fascinated with American culture. Anyway, my point about saying all that is a lot of Japanese people look at American culture with fondness. Hiroki is one of them. And on top of that, he also studied in Alaska for a few years. So think about this like, wait, think Lana Del Rey. You know, she has this deep obsession to old Hollywood, early 1900, romanticized James Dean, Paul Newman, the great Gatsby vibe. Hiroki probably loved a lot of cultural things that happened in the 50 and 60. Hence why he chose the bandana from those era. He could easily source them from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, probably be cheaper, but he chose to do it from the 50s and 60s. So he probably loved a TV show or something that he saw there. Similar to my channel, you know, I used the yellow font because I grew up in the 90s, well, in the 2000s, but I watch a lot of the 90s movies with the subtitle and it's all in yellow font. So I incorporate that into my channel. If it is not obvious, that was a lot of speculating, possibly over romanticizing, but I would not put it past Hiroki. I would not put it past Visbum. Hiroki, he's very purposeful with his design and his production. Uh, my opinion. So, the bandana. I really like the novelty idea of using vintage bandana, and I believe I used that word novelty, right? If I'm wrong, correct me. There are so many bandana print jacket, shirt, pants, whatever on the market, but Visbum decided to choose to use real vintage 50, 60 material. Obviously, Hiroki and the team could have easily used current bandana. He could probably find it for 50, five cents a pop, you know. He could probably use that and nobody would know or care about. But Visum as the brand, they're very committed to excellence. They're very committed to tying the products that they push out to something that they feel fondness for, you know. I grew up in the 90s, so I referenced the 90s a lot, 90s movies, early 2000 music movies. We just, when we, when we reference something that we love, we always try to keep it as authentic as possible. He could have easily faked it, but he didn't. All of that is to say I'm very proud and I'm very happy when I wear this jacket. If somebody were to come up to me and say, hey, I really like your jacket. Is that real vintage bandana or is that just printed? You know, they probably think it's printed, but I will explain the story to them, what Visma is, how they did it, the mud dye process, the sourcing of the vintage bandana from the 50 and 60. There's a story to it. You know, fashion is about communicating 
a story to your consumer, to the wearer. So I think a lot of brands kind of forget that fashion overall has become very revenue based, very get a viral moment out of it. I also want to touch quickly about the Paisley pattern, bandana print that we know of. So we all know it, but most of us don't know the history or the origin. So let's learn about it together. Firstly, Paisley is a town in Scotland. Secondly, it was not originated from there. Let's rewind the clock back to around 280 to the Sassanid Empire. The pattern that you see is of a cypress tree which represents life and eternity in Zoroastrianism, the religion that Christianity ripped off. Look into it. Anyway, so how did this print make its way to Europe, specifically Scotland? Riding round in a rover. You must learn that I see Optimus Prover. Britain loved the spice and the fabric, imported a shit ton to the island, but then, you know, the demand far exceeded the supply. So to meet the demand, factories in England and Scotland started producing their own Paisley print. A town in Paisley, Scotland became famous for it, maybe because they were the first at the market, maybe they were the largest, maybe they were the best. I couldn't find out and I don't think it's that important, but the point is it became popular because of the shortage. Riri zipper, I'll start off with this. It is not better than Rakagni. It gets stuck way more often. It feels cheaper than Rakagni. And it just, I'm not a fan. The chain or the teeth of the zipper is not as good. The slider is not as smooth. It's lighter. It doesn't feel as good to the touch. But the compliment I can give Riri, but specifically this zipper, is that the coat is reversible, right? So this zipper accommodates that. You can flip the slider or polar from one side to the other, which is just, it's a clever, clever idea. The lining is made from rayon. In my experience, rayon is a lot better than polyester, than viscose and silk. It's slightly thicker. It feels better to the touch. We are going to talk about the lining of this beautiful, beautiful Visvum coat. But before we talk, let's just look at the print real quick together. <laughs> The battle that is on this lining is called the Battle of Little Big Horn. If you go with the battle, you would mainly get these imagery or painting. And all of these print is not the entire battle, by the way. If you look here, you can see that it's the same print upside down. And then on the sleeve, it's just it's the same print. I think only this region is the battle and the pattern just repeated throughout the lining. Okay, so a quick history of the Battle of Little Big Horns or the Battle of Greasy Grass known to the Native American. Fought on June 25th, 1876 near the Little Big Horns River in Montana Territory. Territory, federal troops led by Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer against a band of Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne warriors such as Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Chief Gall, Lame White Man, Two Moon, Pretty Nose, and many more. Tension between the two groups has been rising since the discovery of gold on Native American lands. When a number of tribes missed the federal deadline to move to reservations, Custer and his 7th Cavalry was dispatched to confront them. Custer was unaware of the number of Native Americans fighting under the command of Sitting Bull at Little Bighorn, and his forces were outnumbered and quickly overwhelmed. Custer and many of his men died in the war, mutilated, scalped, and embarrassed. This battle marked the most decisive Native American victory and the worst U.S. Army defeat in the Long Plain Indian War. The demise of Custer and his men outraged many white Americans and confirmed the image of Indians as wild and bloodthirsty. After the battle, U.S. government sent more men and in the next few years, most tribe in the area surrendered and moved to reservation. The painting that I showed earlier was by Cassilly Adams. It's a very white-centric painting, you know, putting Custard in the middle, making him look like the hero of the story. Even the name of the battle, Custard Last Stand. So it paints Custard as a hero, for which he was not, killed many men, many children. But this is just one of the many examples of American propaganda. He lost the battle, so you know, he wasn't heroic at all. Similar to American and their refusal to admit their defeat in Vietnam War. They just say, hey, you know, we left, you know, we didn't care about the war anymore. No, you lost the battle. You lost the war. You lost to the Viet Cong. It's okay. So you saw the painting by Cassilli and then you saw the print on the Visvum. So it's very different. And that is because the Visvum lining is an homage or inspired by the drawing or painting done by Red Horse. A Lakota Sioux warrior at the time later became chief who was present at the war. There were many other drawings for other warriors but from the battle, but the most well-known and well-preserved was done by Red Horse. He did about 42 pictographs or ledgers of the battle. I couldn't find all 42, but I'll show you what I can find.
Hiroki and the team at Vismo simplified the painting by using only red and blue. They did blue with indigo dye, they did red with cochineal dye, and then they mud dyed the whole lining. In the red horse, they were a bit more colorful, but I like the simplification. You can also see the mutilation, the scalping, the beheading. A lot of brands would have shied away from this because they fear controversy, they fear the backlash. I'm very glad that Hiroki stuck to his guns and they didn't care about the backlash. They said, I'm gonna make this as realistic as possible. And you know, prior to purchasing this jacket, I didn't know about the Battle of the Big Horn or should we say Greasy Grass. Now this is just a theory. I think on one of his many trips across America, he visited the Lakota tribe, learned about their, learned about their history, felt compelled to share their history because of the whitewashing of the Adams drawing and then you know because Red Horse his drawing I didn't know existed I when I google battle of little big horns the first thing is the Adams picture so I think Hiroki got close to the tribe he just felt compelled to share their story and now I'm passing on all the knowledge that I researched and now I'm passing on to you guys hopefully you do the same the first detail I want to talk about the bandana it was the main reason as to why I purchased this. Vintage bandana sourced from the 50 to 60 in the US and Japan. Possibly France and Italy, Hiroki and the team, they travel a lot to learn new technique, to new fact, excuse me, new factories, new tannery. They always just try to incorporate everything that they can learn to make the best garment that they can. There are about eight to 10 complete bandana on this coat. My favorite though has to be this one. It has this blue that really separated from the rest of the garment. Also the shape on the edges of that bandana, they're very different from the rest. This particular pattern is the most normal to me. So the blue, it just, it separates itself and it just, it's so distinct. You and I have seen liner jackets. This one is also known for their iris liner vest. By the way, I'm not too sure why they're so hyped up, why people are in love with it. I don't know, I, I don't get, I don't get a vest. I, it just, it's never been my thing. So the iris liner, it just, I don't get why they're so popular. Maybe I'll get it one day, so. I can understand it better, but for now, I really don't get it. This liner coat is meant to be worn as like a second layer. I think it has its origin from the military. It's supposed to be lightweight and while also providing the most amount of warmness because the soldiers, they do have to carry a lot of things. So the lighter it can be, the better. And Vismum, they do take a lot of inspiration from the military, I believe, just by looking at it. You know, they have like the MA1 bomber jacket, the boots that are very weather proof. It just Fizzmem is a very universal brand. They, they take a lot of inspiration from Americana, Japanese, um, Native American, uh, outdoor, Japanese production technique, Japanese culture, American culture, all of that. And you know, a lot of their material, it just is from Europe because you know, there are more tanneries and more mills, more farm, more fur related stuff. Factories in Europe overall, just they're, they're more prominent there. There are a lot more factories in Europe because the continent is more or less more stabilized than say Japan or American. I mean, the American continent, mm, America has never been known for making clothes. We've America has always been an importer of clothes. Okay, back to the shape. I am personally not the biggest fan of the shape because I think the length is a bit too long. It's in that no man zone for me where it's not cropped, but it's not down to your knees. It's just down to your thighs, which I'm personally not a fan, but on the practical side, it does cover more of your body. So if you take it at face value as this jacket to provide you with warmth, it's great that it's longer. The other thing about this coat is the lack of collar. It, I'm not a fan of this lack of collar, but I have found a way around it. One of which is I have this recurrent hood. So I put the hood on, so the hood acts as like a collar. And the other thing is I will typically wear this over a jacket, like my body jacket with the collar. So then I just, I want something there around my neck area to make it look more full. It feels really lacking when there's no collar, but I do get that this is supposed to be a middle layer. So you're supposed to wear it underneath a coat or a jacket or something, you know? So I get it, but it just, this, this coat, it would have been a lot better had it come with a spread collar. Another flaw of the length is that the vintage bandana, you know, I don't want to sit on it too much because the fabric, they're really old. So I always try to be extra careful when I wear this coat. And one of the things that helped alleviate this problem is the fact that you get double zipper or yeah, so you can zip it up. And then when you do sit the, the, the coat, they spread out so you don't sit on the fabric. 
You don't want to put unnecessary stress on it if you don't have to. The sleeve. Um, we'll talk about the fit later, but the sleeve is one of the few that I'm not the biggest fan of. I want my sleeve to be a lot longer. This is very fitted. Maybe it's because I got it in a size 1, but everything else fits so perfectly and oversized, you know. So I really wanted the sleeve to really cover it up down to my knuckles. So it fit. It comes down to like right here, which is fine. It's not the end of the world, but I really love like putting my hand in the sleeve when it's cold or when I'm bored. So it would have been great had the sleeve been longer. But again, not the biggest of the world. Not the biggest problem of the world. Most of the problem I'm telling you about. We're we're in the one percent of the one percent of the one percent. If you're owning or watching a guy like me reviewing Visbum. Uh, at the end of the sleeve, there are two buttons so you can close it, make it smaller so there's a less air to flow into your body. I really like that detail. Most brands, they only give you one button, so I love the fact that Visbum gave us two. You can loosely tighten it or you can really tighten it, tighten it. Low armpit, which is great. I never thought I would have to learn about this, but Ragoan taught me about the low armpit and high armpit. Hopefully you guys don't ever have to know that problems. Another detail about the sleeve, it's on the wider side so you can place a hoodie or jacket or a thick down or whatever underneath the sleeve will accommodate all that if it were to be slimmer you would not be able to do that again these small details that i'm going into they make a big impact because this is where fast fashion cuts a lot of these corners to get their expenses down but for Hiroki, for brands that care about their product care about their consumer it's all of these small details that they looked into that give you that edge over other high fashion. Example, the two buttons. That's that could be a deal breaker for someone. It it if I see this coat and another coat that only have one button, I would pick this Visbum coat over that. But just do you see how small detail can play a major role in the decision of someone buying something? This coat is reversible. You know I'm a sucker for reversible item. It's a two in one. Two, two birds, one stone type of situation. It's great. Sometimes when you want to be a bit more subtle, you can just put the bat of greasy grass on the outside. If you want to be a bit more fun, more outgoing, you can put the red vintage bandana on the outside. I love it. This is my first Visbon piece and the fact that I can wear it reversal, just it's beautiful. The battle of greasy grass, it's beautiful. From afar, it's a bit hard to see, but when you get really close, you see all these amazing detailing. The indigo dyed of the US Army, the cochineal dyed of the Native American, the mud dyed, it's just beautiful, beautiful stuff. When I worn these as on the reversal with the battle of greasy grass on the outside, I've caught myself just admiring the print, just looking at all the mutilated body, just, it's really good. I love the battle of greasy grass, hence why I made a separate video about it. That's how much I love it. I think it's great that Visbum really took that extra effort to make the lining something. Like, they saw a blank space and they chose to do something with it. They could have easily left it empty and just put a rayon lining, but the fact that they put this battle on there, just, again, small detail. It, it really, really is the deciding factor for me. Okay, so you just saw the measurement. Firstly, I would like to say they do not fit like a typical size 1 Japanese product. I am 175 pounds, 4 foot 21 inches. I typically wear a size large, extra large. So let's say I would need a size 4 or size 5 in Japanese, in Japanese sizing. I did so much research prior to purchasing this because I thought Essence made a mistake with their measurement. Had to double check and then I pulled the trigger because I am a lot more comfortable when retailers such as Matches Fashion, Essence, Mr. Porter, they measure the garment individually and not like, let's say, Ragoin.eu. They don't have like individual measurement of the product. They just have the sizing chart and the conversion. So I really, I hope, I hope this practice of measuring the product individually is more widely used with regard to recommendation on sizing i think these came out in a size zero to size three so i would say get a size one or size two no matter what your frame is because it's gonna fit you i wouldn't go with a size zero or size three the size zero is gonna be way too small not way too small the size zero is not gonna fit you as well as a size one or two size three it's gonna be oversized on anyone unless you're 300 pounds get a size one or size two this coat retail for five thousand dollars. If you're watching this video, if you know Visbum, you know that you know their pricing. 
Visum is a bit easier to justify their price tag, sourcing the vintage bandana, mud dye, indigo dye, cochineal dye, transportation, import, export fees, runway shows, uh, utility, the R&D stage, there's a lot in it's easier to justify because you realize how much Hiroki pay attention to the small details. I don't think this piece is seasonal either. I've only seen it from the Fall Winter 22 collection. It might become seasonal if it sells really well and if Hiroki and the team really likes the silhouette. The Visum Kerchief, the jacket, that one is seasonal, I know that. But this coat, I think I've only seen it once. But again, I'm not an expert at Visum. If you are, let me know in the comment. Tell me what other season it has shown up in. After owning this coat though, I can definitely see myself buying more Visman pieces because I really, I really enjoy researching it. I really enjoy the vintage bandana, the mud dye, the cochineal dye, the indigo dye, and then just wearing it. I really love wearing the white Polish goose down. It's so, so good. It's so warm, but so lightweight. This coat, it was made with a purpose. It has a story. It's made with love and it's crazy. A crazy amount of Japanese cum, which is just superior than every other cum. With regard to what wearing it is like, let's talk about pants first. I think this coat look amazing with wide-legged trousers. Whenever I think about wearing this coat, I always go for my needle flare trousers. They look so good together. They also look great with my banana trousers. The coat has this very relaxed vibe to it, so it doesn't look that good when you wear them with a proper pair of trousers or skinny trousers. However, it's very opinion based, you know, it's very subjective. You may disagree, you may agree. And with regard to footwear, this coat goes with pretty much everything. Chunky shoes with chunky coat, I think it looks good. With my Guidi boots, they look okay, but I think they look better with my Kiss boots. There's that feminine nature that the Kiss boots give out versus the masculine nature of the coat. Uh, they don't particularly look that good with the tractor boots. I mean, they look good sometimes, but it's very mood based, I think. Ideally, I would wear them with other boots, but if it's really cold out, I will wear the Luna Tractor boots. With regard to tops, the coat, they look amazing with a hoodie underneath or anything with a collar. Just anything to make up for the lack of collar. I wrote a lot more for what wearing it is like. Once again, I'll write them in the comments so I can add more findings if I find anything else interesting. For people who are looking to buy this coat, I would recommend you read everything. It's a bit repetitive, but take what you can out of it because some point might say, okay, I really want that now. Some point might be... Maybe it's not for me. I'll just move on to the next garment on my wish list. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoy watching this video. If you got any questions, leave it in the comment. I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability. If I got any facts wrong, please leave it in the comment. We will be civil. We'll talk it out. Just cite your source. And if I'm wrong, if I'm bursting up with new information, I don't mind being corrected. I don't get defensive. I know some people do, but it's okay. It just, none of this really matters at the end of the day. We're talking about clothes. It's not life or death. My name is Makasi. I will see you next week. Bye-bye.